My name is Harry Michelle. I came to Boca Raton in 1967 with my late wife, June, and a two-year-old daughter. And thank you so much for joining us today, Harry. Um, my name is Sandy Altner. I am a volunteer with the Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum. And this project is to record the oral history of the Jewish community <coughs> of Boca Raton. And we are uh, at February 1st today, 2017. And we are at Lynn University in the wonderful television studios provided for us here. Um, so mm -hmm. the first thing I would like to talk to you about is why in 1967 you came here with June. Well, I, in 1967, I was uh, working in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, I had been up there five years w with IBM and uh, was getting a little tired of the cold weather and uh, being uh, originally from Louisiana, I wasn't quite used to all of it, although I had spent two years in Alaska in the military. Uh, I was looking to sort of get out of Poughkeepsie and I had put a request in to move south, but that hadn't progressed any. And then IBM announced that they were going to put a uh, site down here in Boca Raton to do the small computers. And uh, I talked to the wife at home, and uh, we said, OK, that sounds interesting. But uh, first, we got to find out where Boca is. We had no idea whatsoever where Boca was. And on the map, it showed us it was between West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale and, and on the ocean. And we said, that looks good to us. So I put the request into IBM and was one of the first uh, 200 to selected to come down and help start the Boca Raton plan up. That's fantastic. Now, you had not then come to Boca Raton in advance of moving here? Uh, no, I didn't even know where Boca was. Uh, my, my family, my dad especially, loved to go to Miami Beach uh, for his vacations every summer. Uh, and we drove down from Louisiana to uh, Boca, I mean to Miami. Uh, but. Uh, I had no idea where Boca was until we saw it on the map, but South Florida sounded good to us, so we agreed to come. How much, a how much longer after you made that decision did you actually end up coming here? Uh, probably a, a couple months. Uh, we were told in advance that uh, when you go down there, you may have to go to San Jose to pick up some programs. Uh, I was in the computing department, information technology department, uh, to pick up some programs to help start up the Boca plant from San Jose. Uh, so I, we were aware of that. But we came down here, um, and even before that, I called the realtor. This is an interesting story. I called the realtor down here, and I said, uh, we're coming down with a two-year-old daughter. We're expecting to have at least one or more children, uh, so we'd like a four-bedroom house. And five minutes later, she picks herself up off the floor and says, uh, sir, you don't understand what Boca is, do you? And I said, no. She says, it's 87% retirees. They have never heard of a four-bedroom house. <laughs> and so I said, OK, try three-bedroom. And we came down here, and there were a whole five three-bedrooms on the market. And we luckily picked one of those and bought that. We were able to buy that before we went out to San Jose for three months, where uh, most of the people who came down here had a bigger family. And they had the experiences, the woes of trying to build down here when people didn't know how to build houses, especially four and five bedroom houses. So you had to go to California for a few months first? We went to San Jose, California and spent three months out there. I went to work every day and she and the daughter stayed by the pool and played in the pool, by the pool every day. Well, that's a very nice life, it sounds like. Yeah, she enjoyed <laughs> it. It was getting a little monotonous by the end of three months. <laughs> so then when you arrived in Boca Raton, do you remember what you first saw here, what your first impression was? Uh, a lot of palm trees. and. Uh, it's a very small community. Um, like I said, 87% retiree. Um, you, you walked around and you walked in any of the stores. Uh, you saw a lot of uh, gray-haired and, and older people. Uh, very few younger families around here at that point in time. I think they had one elementary school at that time. Um, and uh, we thought it was going to be a very interesting experience getting uh, used to it, really. Uh, but luckily, we, you know, we moved into our three-bedroom house, and we were in it for probably 20, 25 years. And we Did you have um, anything of a Jewish community to greet you? Uh, we, when we came back from San Jose, they were just getting ready to have this uh, inaugural meeting. Um, I think it was Purim time or something, where just get together to discuss if there's enough interest for uh, a Jewish community down here. 
And the people turned out uh, very excited, and um, the few of us who were there, uh, we uh, said, okay, let's try to give it a whirl. And we pu put a name for the Hebrew congregation of Boca Raton, and, and that was what we were known for a while. Um, and uh, we started trying to increase our membership from the few people we had, and we called everybody who had a Jewish name in the phone book to see uh, if they would let us put their name on their potential membership. Uh, got hung up on quite a few times, uh, but we did get started that way. Um, and we got a, a, a Torah donated. Uh, we had a wonderful gentleman um, named Lynn Harris, who was our lay rabbi. Um, and um, we met over at the, what's now the Lions Club for our Friday night services. And eventually uh, we had our first high holiday service um, a year or so later out at uh, Lynn Marymount University, which is now Lynn, um, with a lot of the nuns in attendance. Uh, we got a student rabbi, uh, Alvin Sugarman, uh, who's now the main rabbi up at uh, the temple in Atlanta. So he's really made a step for a name for himself. And um, we got started basically on that. After we left the Lions Club, we went to uh, uh, Moravian Church. We had our services there for a number of years until we were able to start the building going over in uh, where we are on 4th Fourth, Fourth Avenue. So this ultimately became Temple Bethel. Yeah. Right. It, uh, when we grew up and uh, we had enough people, we moved the name, uh, talking to the reform in Cincinnati to uh, get the name changed to Temple Bethel. When about did that happen? Uh, was that quite a ways ago? Like was It was already in 1970s when oh it was yeah. Temple Bethel, Yeah. right? Yeah, it took us a number of years till we, till we get, had enough people. We had a needed a couple hundred people, I think. When you started that with, um, you know, when you talked about having a few people got together and so on, were these people you knew or had you been in the community for a while? Uh, basically, no, I did not know any of them. Did someone uh, approach you with that to come in? Um, well, I, I'm trying to remember now. The, uh, somehow we got word that this, there was a, a meeting of Jewish people and um, that you know tickled our interest really, and uh, that's how we kind of got to uh, meet him. Uh, I didn't know him before, uh, and we certainly didn't have a large abundance. And you know, as we got started, then um, more people from IBM came in, and a large group came in um, working for a company in, that was started up in Boynton, and, and there were a number of Jews there, and we increased our membership that way really. I'm very interested in, um, were you particularly looking for a reform congregation? Was this something that was part of your lifestyle prior to coming down to Florida? Uh, yes, I, uh, I was brought up reform in Louisiana. Uh, I had three generations of my family living there before, and uh, it was about 120 people in the, uh, the congregation, a relatively small city. and so we had we always had uh, reform. I never was bore. I mean, never was bore Medford, uh, and our claim to fame with uh, Hebrew was the Shema and the Barahu. And after that, we had no Hebrew other than those two prayers. So it was very liberal, uh, and I, I wasn't looking for that necessarily. But I was looking for uh, reform. Uh, my late wife was uh, brought up conservative. And, uh, but she came down and adopted to it very easy because we, we both got involved with the uh, beginning of the temple and uh, got going that way. In fact, we had the, uh, the first Sunday school, uh, which had a whole 10 kids in it, at my house. Uh, f we had one classroom inside the house, which she taught, and my mother-in-law, uh, Charlotte Aaron, uh, taught the uh, small kids out on the patio. So we had, that was a, took care of us for a couple of years to get the Sunday school going before we were able to move it to classrooms over at Moravian Church. Why the church? Uh, they were very nice in donating all the facilities to us. So we could use it on Friday night, we could use it for Sunday, and they were just a, a very nice uh, workable agreement with us. I don't remember who contacted them, but I know they were very nice about it. What did it feel like to have services uh, in synagogue basically inside a church? 
Did you have to um, cover um, icons and no, things? No, you just. Um, I've heard from a number of people who had uh, bar mitzvahs there that it was kind of interesting to have the bar mitzvah up there and a big cross behind you. Uh, but it didn't it didn't stop us in any way. Um, I, I don't I don't even think we noticed it that much really. Um, because we, you know, we just had wanted a place to go, and they were very nice about it, and uh, donated, their fa donated their facilities, and uh, so we were able to take them up on it, really. And you've had, from the outset, as you said, in these early days, nuns come to High Holy Day services oh, yes. as well. Oh, they, they, uh, they were very interested. Sister Delacroix was uh, very interested in helping us. She was just like a, a member to us as far as getting us tied in to certain people in the community and helping us uh, in the religious areas and because she was a very liberal nun and really helped us out tremendously. It's interesting to me and I think to many people that um, what you're telling me really is that the story of the interfaith communities in uh, Boca Raton in particular mm -hmm. and the work that was done uh, at, the, at the grassroots level and certainly with Rabbi Singer, but it preceded Rabbi Singer's involvement because of this kind of involvement in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we were very involved with it. Um, the rabbis, um, there were several before Merle, uh, were very involved with the, uh, re the uh, religious minister con um, council in, in uh, Boca. And um, everybody w worked together very, we were very good after we moved into uh, Fourth Avenue to have a good working relationship with St. Jones across the street. And um, they came to our services a lot of times. They invited us over to them. And um, Merle was a real instigator in getting us involved with the, uh, the other, other temples and congregations in the area. We were the only temple, but you know, the other religious congregations in the area. Was it very important to you then, Harry, when you first moved down here with June and your, your little child, mm -hmm. two years old, was it very important for you as a family then to find a place to worship? Um, I think it became more so after uh, we came down here and we got involved with getting it started uh, and seeing the building blocks going up, um, getting started with some services, uh, her getting started with the uh, Sunday school and having a place for our kids to learn about Judaism and uh, things like that. Um, I took on the, the job as president my second year down here. I was actually the third president of the congregation and I had a tremendous year. I, I doubled up the membership from 26 to 52. And I, thought, I thought that was a big deal. <laughs> and I still can remember um, standing on the, uh, what I called the Bema still, on the pulpit over at Moravian Church, you know, giving the high holiday talk from the president over there and um, seeing my young son, who was the first boy brought, born into the congregation, asleep on the, uh, the benches, which he did all the time. But, he, you know, he was a couple years at that, at that time. Um, my daughter was uh, Merle's first bat mitzvah when uh, he came down here. She was just getting ready for a bat mitzvah and he was, she was his first bat mitzvah. In fact, she revolutionized the music industry because she wanted to play the guitar and sing the uh, religious songs and he approved it, uh, much to the chagrin of uh, Cantor Rosen. And, uh, and she did, she did the whole bat mitzvah singing it. Wonderful. And what year was that? Um, Let's see, she was born in 65, 13, 78. In 1978. And when we think about 1978, doesn't seem that long ago, but it is that long no, ago. And we had a building then. <laughs> mm -hmm. The building came about uh, in what year? Middle 70s. Sometimes. In the middle so we 70s. In, yeah. And with that, um, I'm just trying to put into context what you found here in the way of a Jewish community. Obviously, not very much when you mm -hmm. first arrived. And can you give us an idea of physically what Boca looked like other than just lots of palm trees? Were there many condos? Were there many uh, homes here? Yeah, they, there weren't as many because uh, the city didn't go out very far. I mean, I think it went basically west as far as um, most mil like military trail or um, where the town center, shopping centers today, that was basically all housing and area. And out further than that, you, 
you got the forms, especially you got out to uh, 441, you had the migrant forms and uh, workers out there and so forth. Um, so it didn't go out very far. We had uh, a number of condos, uh, Boca Tica, uh, some, con some congregate, some temples, uh, I'm sorry, um, developments uh, down in Raw Palm in the South Boca. And that was pretty much, I think, the only, if I can remember correctly, the only gated community around. But uh, there was a lot of um, anti-Semitism around then. Uh, I personally, thank goodness, did not encounter that either in Louisiana or here. Uh, but I know a num number of my friends did. Um, how did it manifest? It's, um, the, uh, how was it seen <coughs> to these people, the anti-Semitism here? It bothered uh, some people tremendously. Um, what forms of anti-Semitism did they well, talk about? Raw Palm, for instance, uh, allowed no Jews if they wanted to build in or, or buy in there. Um, Delray Beach had signs, uh, no dogs, no Jews allowed. And uh, considering how many Jews live in Delray night right now, you would never have ever thought that would have been possible. Uh, we didn't have signs like that in Boca. Uh, it was a much more liberal in that area. Uh, and you had to almost look for it, I think, to find anti-Semitism in Boca. Uh, you could go out of your way to find it. Um, we had a few people I know um, were a, probably a little bit obnoxious and people thought about it as eh, those darn Jews and you know turned against them in that respect. Um, but we never had the, uh, the problem like that really. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about IBM too because that mm -hmm. was such a large part of uh, the reason why a lot of people came to Boca. Mm -hmm. um, what was the reason for IBM to choose Boca? They wanted a, a new place in the south because they and, and they wanted one with a lot of land and there was a lot of open land still in Boca at that time. Uh, I think once they came in here and after a number of years they saw that the, the problems involved with getting the uh, computers to ship out of here to go the length of Florida and then go all over the country and the world, uh, they may have given a second thought to it, but that at that time they uh, decided to make the move down here. And I think that had a tremendous impact on the Boca area because it brought in so many more younger families, uh, some seniors, but more, more younger families, and the need for housing and the need for shopping and need for all of that type of stuff. And um, it was very good for the community. It really was, because I don't think Boca would have developed without IBM at that point. And it, it was an early shaper of the community because it gave a reason for families like yours mm -hmm. to come here. Um, you say that you were among the first 200. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, how many employees came to work at IBM uh, here in Florida? We had 11,000 at our peak. So basically... Um, All in Boca? <coughs> yeah. Boca, and there was a couple of rental places in Delray. Uh, most of them were out there on your model road, uh, and, they had some, and they ran out of room there, and they had some lease facilities uh, in Delray. But uh, What was the work that IBM was doing here? Was this complete from start to finish manufacturing and, yeah. and design and so on? It was the manufacturing of the small PC, the Model 20, and Model 30s. Um, these were the new PCs which were were just being invented. Um, the founder of the uh, PC, Don Estridge, was the head of the lab here, and it was developed down here. Uh, and they did the manufacturing and all the lab work for those small computers. And uh, as, as they developed on, then we got into some bigger equipment. But uh, that, was, that was pretty much the start. The lab developed it and then, <coughs> excuse me, manufactured it here and uh, just got bigger and bigger. So would there have been um, sensitivities, certainly, uh, would there have been any sensitivities in IBM about Jewish people coming to work for IBM? Uh, I don't think so. Um, it was never ever mentioned to me and I never saw it mentioned anywhere around. Um, I'm sure people had priorities and but uh, you never knew who was what religion or nobody cared what religion it was. And that's one of the good things about it. Um, it uh, just they had a need for people and 
if you provided that need, they, they needed you there. And I would, like I said, I was one of the first 200 here. And by the time they said, well, they're moving out of Boca, uh, and that 11,000 went down to a real small number. So I basically saw the birth and the death of IBM while I was down here, really. I retired back in 92. And when did, did IBM move out? Uh, it was pretty much the next couple of years. They still got a couple of uh, sales offices and a couple of small engineering offices down here. I think I saw that they had about 500 people in the area right now, which is not much they can all fit in one building. It's very interesting to me to think that the Jewish community grew from basically nothing, as you've described, mm -hmm. in 1967 with uh, uh, you and the other volunteers of Temple Beth El, which mm -hmm. was then the Hebrew <coughs> congregation mm -hmm. of Boca Raton, right. um, picking up the phone book and looking for people who might be interested in becoming that's, part of a reform that's congregation. pretty much the only way we could do it, really, um, because people, you know, had not broadly broadcast the fact that they were Jewish. There was no reason for it um, because there was no Jewish facilities here. So, you know, you're not going to run around saying I'm Jewish and so forth. but once we got a Jewish identity, uh, people were more willing to uh, come out of the woodwork and join us, and uh, our ranks grew like that, really. When we now look at Boca Raton, which mm -hmm. um, is, is very much a Jewish community, we, we look at the numbers that tell us that over half of the people, over 50% of the people who live in Boca Raton mm -hmm. proper, uh, identify as Jewish. Mm -hmm. So that means all flavors, all um, cultural, all religious, mm -hmm. all whatever it is that anyone would consider mm -hmm. to call themselves Jewish, whether it's by you know family background or by the fact that they're very religious. Yeah. How do you think that happened? Um, that's an interesting question because uh, when we started up, Bethel was uh, the first temple in the area, and I, know, I don't know how many they've got it in the teens right now, just in Boca, plus Delray and Boynton and everything else. Um, we got to the fact that uh, we just got so big that um, we helped our assistant rabbi, Rabbi Eigler, uh, to help form Beth you know, Temple Israel up on 51st Street, and now they've become a, a good-sized community. And you always had Temple B'nai uh, Torah the conservative one, and then Chabad has come in, and I think there are a couple of Orthodox synagogues around. And you know, as the people came down with their backgrounds, they started up whatever they were familiar with as far as the temple goes. And I know the, um, the Reformed Temple itself, um, we're leaning, or at least Beth has, Bethel has been leaning, more toward conservatism uh, than the ultra reform. Uh, there's more Hebrew uh, in the service, more prayers in Hebrew, more songs in Hebrew, uh, and at least we had when we started back in uh, 67 and so forth. We were just a typical reform then, but uh, it's very much a leaning toward conservative in the services now with the prayers and the, and the songs and so forth. It's interesting to me, too, that when you start with um, calling around people, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, getting into the phone book to try to build a congregation. And we look at the congregation of Temple Beth El today and it's over 1,400 families. Mm -hmm. y you must be very proud. Oh yeah, and it was a lot bigger than that at one point. And I, I think we never ever thought that we would see a number like that um, because it's just way more than you can handle. Um, you lose a lot of the closeness when you get that big. Uh, and I think they realized that at uh, Bethel, uh, and they've made some changes over there in the, in the years uh, lately that uh, they uh, put in more clubs, uh, more um, organizations to uh, work with the different age groups, uh, which they didn't have before, uh, more types of services, and uh, they started, uh, they have two places for Sunday schools now and uh, things like that. And um, I think they're, they're willing to work with the, any of the other temples in the area, to, you know, which I don't think you saw, would have seen a number of years ago. Do you identify Boca as particularly a Jewish community? Does it look different than other communities you've been in? Um, 
I don't, uh, because I was never, you know, o felt overly Jewish, um, which is a not, I don't mean that in a derogatory form, but uh, being Reform, and I, ne I never was um, one that went to services, you know, every Friday night and so forth. I always went to holidays and some Friday nights and so forth. But uh, I uh, found that uh, when we, of course, when we came down here, there were no Jewish organizations to belong to. Um, so I, in turn, got into other community organizations because my wife and I both wanted to get involved, to meet other people in the community. Uh, and so she got involved her way. I got involved with JCs, and then after I aged out of that into Kiwanis, and then on into other, other avenues and other community groups. But I've always felt that, you know, there was a need in the community, and I got involved, and I was always accepted like that, and we were both accepted like that, really. What has it done for your children to have been raised in Boca Raton, in um, a fledgling Jewish <coughs> community? Uh, they felt good. Um, my daughter was luckily by the time she uh, she got bar mitzvahed, there were a number of uh, kids her age, so that you could actually have a bar mitzvah party for the and have a lot of kids involved. Uh, when we first came here, if that would have been the case, it would have been you know not as, not as good. Uh, she has always um, kept her Jewish religion um, as a, a very high means. Her kids were both born in Bad Mitzvah. Um, my sons it was the same way. They don't. I don't think they go to services. They go to holiday, high holidays. Uh, but both of the kids were raised Jewish, and uh, he had two daughters, so uh, they both had Bat Mitzvahs, and they both uh, uh, have always uh, followed the Jewish part. Her, their youngest daughter's in high school, and he's, she's head of the BBYO. Jewish teenage group up in Orlando and uh, doing wonders for that and getting that going. But uh, they've always been involved with it and uh, I think it's always been good for them. And they've seen what my wife and I did in the community and so they got involved with commu different community organizations also that where they could uh, work with uh, other people and for the betterment of the communities where they lived. When you look at all of the changes that came from those early days when you first arrived in Boca Raton mm -hmm. and looked around and saw, oh my goodness, there's not very much here, to what you see now, what do you think is most interesting or remarkable about what you've seen over that 50 year, 50 year time period? Um, <coughs> I think the fact that I used to feel that you know, if we went somewhere and there was a crowd of people I would know most people, know almost everybody, you know, like they used to have fa street fairs and art shows and so forth. I used to feel like I would know most of them. And I know we've come to, uh, and I lived here for about 42 years before we moved away um, up to Asheville for nine and a half years. But uh, I, th I used to think that when we were smaller, you know, I, I go to the art shows since we've been back. and. I, I don't see anybody I know. I mean, it's just gotten so big and so tremendously, and num such a tremendous number of people that uh, you don't really see a lot of your old friends unless you specifically make an effort to call them and get together with them and so forth. Have, have you now moved back here? Uh, yeah, we're building a home out in Parkland. It's a 55 plus community, a new, new 55 plus community out in Parkland. So we're just renting until our home is ready. Home is ready and completed. And why did you choose to come back to Boca? Um, we have fa both of us, my wife and I, have family down here. Uh, we have good friends down here, and uh, we felt that we were getting up in age. And uh, Asheville, we were sort of we were starting to lose some f our friends up there, and um, we could see sort of maybe the hand on the wall. We're get as we're getting up in age, we we wanted to cut down. We felt the the uh, medical facilities. Uh, in this whole area of South Florida would be better in case anything happened to us. And in case anything happened to one of us, we didn't want the other one to be kind of stranded on an island up there uh, and not have anything, not any place to go or something. So Boca has become not just home for those 42 years, but a permanent home for you. Uh, basically, yeah. I mean, and, and if you're if you're here for 42 years, you, you're not a visitor. You're you feel like a permanent resident because you don't find too many people that have said they, that you were here for 42 years. 
that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one last question. Mm -hmm. What um, is Boca a good place to be Jewish? I would say so. Um, if I had to come down here now, uh, I would definitely be more active uh, in the Jewish community uh, because they have so much more to offer now. Uh, there are a lot of Jewish organizations at the temple and uh, Federation has to offer a lot to offer. And um, I think it has a lot to offer for not only for adults, but seniors uh, and also for kids now because uh, they're offering trips to uh, Israel uh, to see them at no cost to you. And uh, once you get to be a junior or senior or when you graduate and um, there's a lot more to offer to people coming down with families, really. Um, a lot of uh, seniors are moving down because a lot of the 55 plus communities um, are Jewish. They have uh, small temples uh, inside the communities like Century Village or we're down in Winmore in uh, Coconut Creek. And they have s meetings and, and temple services in those communities for people. And, and they have, uh, there are just a lot more temples in the area, no matter which, you know, you're from, Orthodox, Reform, or Conservative. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, um, I wish you um, nothing but success and happiness. You Thank and your you very wife, much. To be uh, re reestablishing your home here in Boca Raton, and so welcome back. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to being back now. Thank you, and thank you for sharing your stories with okay. us today. Thank you. Thank you.